take your Bible and turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 5. Matthew and chapter 5. <coughs> I want to talk to you on Lordship Salvation, part 2. Part 2. We covered the other night about the subject of Lordship Salvation and how that the teaching of making Christ the Lord and the Master of your life is a wicked teaching and that it comes from keeping the law. As it says in the book of Mark in chapter 12, when the scribe asked Jesus, what is the first commandment? And he says that you shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul. And um, he also says the second is like unto it, and that is to love your neighbor as yourself. And that was the commandment. The Lordship Salvation teaches that you are to make Christ the Lord and the Master of all of your life. And if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And so therefore you have the teaching of the law, putting people under the law, that they must live a certain way in order to be saved. Now, we often say there's only two kinds of people in this world. You know, the saints and the ain'ts. The believers and the unbelievers. The saved and the, and, well, I'm saying they're saved and the lost. But there's only two kinds of people. And uh, there's another one that's given to us in Matthew chapter 5. And I want you to look there in verse 45. <coughs> Matthew 5 and verse 45, where it says, That ye may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Rain on the just and the unjust. That's two classes of people. There are those that are just, and there's those that are unjust. So that's another one that's beside the saints and the ain'ts, the saved and the lost, the believers and the unbelievers. There's the just, and there's the unjust. Well, what's the difference between them? Now, that's an interesting one. So turn in your Bible to the book of Acts in chapter 24. The book of Acts and chapter 24. <coughs> Acts chapter 24, and look there in verse 15. In verse 15 says, And have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. So the resurrection of the dead, the just and the unjust. Now, what will help you is studying the next one that I want you to see. And so take your Bible and look there in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter and chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 and look there in verse 18. <coughs> 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 18 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just, which would refer to Christ, for the unjust, that would refer to the lost. So it rains upon the just and the unjust. It rains upon those who have been justified and those that are not justified. So there's only two kinds of people. So as we sit here this morning, or those that are listening by internet, you're either justified or unjustified. So what would it mean to be justified? It's a terminology that's used in a court of law. You have been found guilty, but the court decision comes down as you're cleared, as though you're innocent, as though you have been declared righteous but not because of what you have done, but because somebody paid your penalty. What you owed to the court, someone paid, and you're justified, just as if you had paid it yourself. You're clear to go free. 
no double in jeopardy, you are free to go. And those charges can never be brought up against you ever again. So when he makes the statement here in verse 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just, who is Christ, for the unjust, that is us, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Now turn in your Bible to the book of Galatians, the book of Galatians and chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. This is important because if you once see that you have been justified, then you do not seek to be justified. And if I am justified, then I do not need to make Christ the Lord and Master of my life in order to be justified. Because I already am justified. You don't need to seek what you already have. Since I have eternal life, I'm not trying to get eternal life. Since I have been declared justified, righteous, I don't have to seek it. I already have it. I don't have to seek to be saved. Why? Because I already am saved. I already have eternal life. So in verse 16 <coughs> of the book of Galatians in chapter 2, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, there is a contrast there. One is true and one is false. You are not justified by the works of the law, so that means that lordship salvation cannot be true. But you're justified by faith and faith only. So therefore, if I'm justified by faith alone, then I can't be justified in the future by any other means. Because I've already been declared justified. It's a done deal. The only way I could in the future be justified by any other way, I'd have to become unjustified. But I can't become unjustified. Oh, I like that. So he says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners. In other words, if you're still a sinner, then evidently Christ did not justify you. If you're still a sinner, then Christ evidently hasn't saved you. You're still a lost man. So why would you seek something that's been done? It's like saying Christ did not do his job. And that's why in verse 21 he says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, Christ died in vain. If you and I could be justified any other way, then Christ did not have to die. But he died because there was no other way. So you see there in verse 17, But if while we seek to be justified, what you're saying is then that you're not yet justified, if you're still seeking to be justified. And that's why he says, in verse 18, for if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. So if you're trying to put yourself back under the law, still seeking to be saved by the things that you do, what you're declaring is, I am not now saved. I am not now justified. I am not now righteous. I'm still seeking something. But I'm not seeking anything, and I haven't for 52 years. Because I have been justified by faith. You see, the book of Romans in chapter 3 says, Justified freely by His grace. So it's a done deal. It's already done. Now take your notes and look there. I want you to see this. <coughs> in the little box, and it's so important to keep these things straight in your mind. This is very, very important. You're going to deal with people who are messed up on this issue of grace versus works. In the little box, when you trust him to take you to heaven, talking about Christ, he becomes your savior. This is salvation. When you allow him to control your life, he becomes your Lord. 
This is service. One is salvation, one is service. Always keep them separate. There's many things you're supposed to keep separate in the Bible. Grace and works have to be kept separate. The two natures, you've got two natures. You've got to keep those things separate. Salvation is the gift. Rewards are earned, and therefore they're separate. Two different things. One, being born into God's family is the gift of God. You didn't earn it. You didn't work for it. You didn't buy it. But once you trust Christ as Savior, there's many things God tells us in his word about how we're supposed to talk and how we're supposed to walk. Why? Because now you're a child of God. And God expects us, desires for us, to walk and to talk like his child. Therefore, that takes some training, being raised, taught. Just like a little child being born into the world, nothing's automatic. But look at this. In the next statement, I have, you must keep the two separate. That's salvation and service. Scripture separates the two, so must you. One is salvation, the other is service. Service involves work, and work cannot save you. Service is not a part of salvation. It is an entirely separate issue to be dealt with only after a person has trusted Christ as Savior. It is only after a person is saved that the Holy Spirit will give him the power to control his own nature and live a life pleasing to the Lord. And then he may, and then he may not. But God says that he does not want us to live in this old wicked sinful world like the world. But he says you're to be lights in the world, <clears throat> according to Philippians 2 and 13 down to verse about 15, 16. Look at the next statement. The false doctrine that you must accept Christ as your Savior and make him master or Lord of your life at the same time to be saved mixes salvation with service. This doctrine is called Lordship Salvation. John MacArthur teaches this. John Piper teaches this. And a multitude of others teach this. And though they may not use the words Lordship Salvation, they simply tell you that you must commit your life to Christ to be saved. That you must make him Lord and Master of all in your life in order to be saved. But see, when you boil it all down, it's still teaching works for salvation. And the majority of independent and Southern Baptist churches teach this doctrine. You may not see it and may not know it, but it is there. I know I've had to deal with it. I've been in a lot of churches. I've listened to a lot of preachers. I've gone to a lot of seminars and all those things. And you'd be surprised how well-meaning individuals contaminate the truth of the gospel. Therefore, it makes it difficult for a person like me to have individuals like that to come and speak in the church. Now, if I have somebody come, like for a college situation, and they're not really right on the money, the students don't have to worry about it because there's somebody else that will talk to them. But in a college situation, sometimes you want the kids to be able to see the difference so that you can explain to them the difference. See what I told you? I remember down at Florida Bible College, Dr. Stanford would have some guys come in there. Oh, my goodness. And all of us kids would sit there and just burn and, and wiggle because we knew that ain't right, that ain't right, that ain't right. And as soon as he gets through, Dr. Stanford comes up and he says, thank you so much. Now, you kids know that we are teaching a little bit different than what you've heard this morning. We do not teach that you have to ask Jesus to come into your heart if the guy said that. Or if he taught and said anything about repentance, we teach that repentance means a change of mind. It does not mean to turn from your sins. And Ray, <laughs> that guy's there. He'll do it. And he did it. I don't know if he ever did it while you was at school, but buddy, I saw it. And uh, he would always deal with it. It was always a wonderful lesson to watch. Because Ray was like a lone ranger. He really didn't care if everybody loved him or not. He was so soul and so in love with the truth of the gospel that he would just give the gospel and let it rip. And, um, but so many people could see the difference. They saw 
It was like, when you really understand the clarity of the God, it's like light that helps you to see and understand the rest of Scripture. The clearness of the gospel is the lens by which we discern God's Word. And if that's fuzzy, man, everything else gets fuzzy. But when it's crystal clear, but you can rightly divide, so much easier. The other thing I want you to see, because this is so important, <coughs> they're in the bold... Adding works to the gospel takes away the power of the gospel, for then it becomes a false message that cannot save. When it says that um, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that what? Believe it. Add works to it, there's no power to it. So if you want power in your life, I've heard so many people say, I just want to have the power of God in my life. Well, then preach a clear gospel, and you'll see a lot more results. I remember that I used to have people, and even preachers, would wonder sometimes. They say, well, I, I don't see how come you have so many people trust the Lord compared to what I do. I says, it might be that you're not making the gospel clear. And they just can't believe that that, that's, that would do it. But it is the clearness of the gospel that helps people to see and to trust the Lord. Look at the next statement. The truth of the matter is... That salvation is not a give proposition at all. It is a take. In other words, you don't give Christ your life. You don't give him your heart, your liver, your lungs, or your toe, or anything else. <coughs> salvation is not you giving him something. It is you receiving from him something. It's a take proposition. He offers to you the gift of eternal life. All you have to do is accept it. So always remember that. There are people who try to get individuals to do something you don't have to do anything because it's done it's already done we don't give our heart lives liver i even put that in there like i can't believe sometimes i forget or anything else to god in order to get him to save us this would be a form of bribery a way of meriting or deserving to be saved but god says salvation not of ourselves and especially it is not offering anything to god Look at the next statement. Salvation is receiving. We simply receive him. John chapter 1 verse 12 says, But as many as give him their heart, no, receive him, to them gave he power, the right, the authority, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. God does the giving, and we do the receiving. And once you understand the principle of it, you can listen to a preacher and you can discern whether or not is he clear or unclear. Because, you see, here's a problem that you'll find. You can go to a church that's not as clear, but it's okay because, see, you're clear and you know the difference and so it's not going to mess you up. <clears throat> but if you go to a church that's not clear, you're also using your money and your power of influence to get others into the same thing, and they may not understand, and they will adapt to that message that you were so glad you were delivered from. And so because of, well, it doesn't matter. I mean, he's not as clear, but, and then you butt it all over the place. Remember, our fellowship with the Lord and our fellowship with each other is supposed to be because of the fellowship of the gospel. Do we believe the same thing? Not to believe the same thing, I can't have good fellowship with those that don't believe like I do. Therefore, I have to limit my... I guess you could say... Uh, Power of influence, because there's not a, an awful lot of them that think exactly like I do. Just me and my brother, and that's it. You know? And then I'm not sure about him. No. <clears throat> but look at this statement, because it's so important. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 is often used in an attempt to support the idea of lordship salvation. And here's why. Because it states this. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. When studying this verse, there are a few things you have to keep in mind. 
And what they say, you must confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life. Well, it doesn't say that. It just says acknowledging that Jesus is the Lord, that he is deity. He is God. I want you to take your Bible and just look with me over the, to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew in chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. <coughs> And you'll notice this same phrase is used, but here it's used in regard to service. And I want you to see the difference because it's so important. Here in Matthew in chapter 10, he has called his disciples together and he gave them power over certain things and told them to go within boundaries, to go to various cities throughout Israel and he told them some of the things that were going to happen to them. And he says that you need to be like your master. And so he says there in verse 25, It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, which is Christ, they called him Christ. Christ was called Beelzebub. Get it straight here. How much more shall they call on them of his household? So if they did that to Christ and he's the master, what do you think he's going to do to his followers? So these are those that were following Christ and he's called the master. So they are serving. So in verse 26, it says, fear them not, therefore, because of what they call you. And then in verse 28, fear them not because of what they can do to you. You know, like take your life, something simple. Verse 31, fear them not, therefore ye are of more value than many sparrows. And he knows the numbers of hairs on your head and the sparrow that falls to the ground. So he says, you are of more value. Therefore he makes this statement in verse 32. Whosoever, therefore, shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. So therefore, you know, you have got to confess Christ before men in order to go to heaven. You've got to make him the Lord and the master of your life, and you've got to serve him. Now, see, I just added a whole bunch of things in there that they didn't say. But this is where they get some of their teaching from. But you need to know what it says. You cannot be afraid of Scripture. That somebody can take it and twist it in such a way that you can't handle yourself. This is why you have to know how to defend your faith. It's good when you know what they believe and the Scriptures they use so that you know how to answer the question. Answer every man that ask if you a reason of the hope that lies within you, that make me challenge you. Can you defend your faith? Well, we're supposed to be able to. But in verse 32, when he says, you must confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. Whosoever shall deny me before men. So he's talking about confessing. And... Um, Somebody's going to recognize me, or he's going to confess me before the Father, and if I deny him, he's going to deny me. Always remember, now, are we talking about salvation, how to get to heaven, or are we talking about service? And as you go down through here, you'd be surprised how that the Scripture just might be able to tell us if it's talking about how to go to heaven, or is he talking about service? But look what he says here in verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He's talking about who you love the most. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You're not worthy. Who do you love the most? Well, see, this isn't talking about how to get to heaven. You, in other words, you'd have to love God more than mom and dad and brother and sister and anybody else in order to go to heaven. You see, loving that much is law. The first law with commandment, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. That's the law. And no man has ever kept the law in order to be saved. 
But now notice what else he says. He says, talking about something being worthy. And he says in verse 38, And he that taketh not his cross, followeth after me, is not worthy of me. But see, following Christ, being worthy, loving him more, all those are the things that deals with service. That has nothing to do with salvation. Because you see, you come to Christ for salvation, and you follow after Christ for service. A guy by the name of um, Richard DeHaan made that very simple and very clear. In the old personal evangelism handbook, it's in there. But now notice what he says here. In verse 39, he that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. So he's talking about how you live your life and who you're living it for. If you live it for you, you lose your life. You live it for him, you saved your life. So it's talking about how you live. But are we talking about salvation or are we talking about service? If we're talking about salvation, it's free. If you're talking about service, then you'll have to earn it. But if you earn it, you get a reward. All right, look what he says in verse 40. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's, uh-oh, what's that word? Reward. And he that receiveth a reward, says, he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Look what he said in verse 42. <coughs> Whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water. See, when you're talking about salvation, you're not talking about giving. You're talking about taking. When it talks about giving a cup of cold water, it's talking about giving, talking about service. If you keep those two things separate, it will help you to divide the scriptures. And he says here, a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple. Verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his salvation. Is that what it said? Shall no wise lose his reward. You see, in the gospel of John in chapter 6, he says, All that come to me shall no wise cast out. Here's talking about no wise loses reward. You cannot lose rewards once they're earned. You only lose what you could have earned and didn't earn. That's why he says, lay up treasure in heaven where thieves can't get it. Nothing can break through and get it. You can't lose it. It doesn't rust. But you see, you can lose rewards that you could have had. And that's why God says, I want you to receive a full reward. But he says here, you can in no wise lose your reward. You can't lose what you've laid up. But so if it's talking about rewards, it must be talking about service. So when he talks about confessing Christ before man, it must be for service and not salvation. Now go back to the book of Romans, back to the book of Romans, and chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. As you go down through here, you'll notice the first part of Romans chapter 10 makes it very clear that there were those in Israel that were trying to be justified by their works. And because they were trying to establish their own righteousness, they did not submit themselves unto the righteousness of Christ. So they tried to establish their own righteousness by the law. So in verse 4, he tells them that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So there's that contrast again. They were trying to earn it by their works of the law. And he says that you simply can have his righteousness by faith alone. So he goes down through here and he makes it very simple that faith is as close as the words that you hear. You don't have to go into heaven. You don't have to get Christ out of hell. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when there are those of us who 
hear the gospel, then we believe it with our heart and confession is made known unto salvation, not for salvation, so that the lost man only has to hear the message in order to believe. Boy, if that is as simple as simple can get. So he says there in verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, or that simply Jesus is Lord. This is who he is. Not the Lord and the master of your life, because once you go that down that trail, you open up a can of worms, and then you're right back up there to verse 2, which he just condemned. Then you'll be trying to establish your own righteousness by making Christ the Lord and the master of my life, and i got to live a certain way. i got to merit it. You just put yourself back under the law, which he says not to do. And then on top of that, to make it really clear, so that everybody understands it, no complications, he tells them in Romans chapter 11, and verse 6, the answer. Wouldn't you like to know what it is? Look in chapter 11 and verse 6. Look what he says. In chapter 6, he makes this, in chapter 11, verse 6, he says, And if by grace, then is it no more of works. This is right after Romans chapter 10. So anyone who tries to put you under the law didn't finish reading. He just states it over again. If by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, because that's the issue that they're discussing. Is it by grace or is it by works? As he says, I bear them record. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of the righteousness of God have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. They're ignorant of it, and are going about trying to establish their own righteousness. So once again, in verse 6 he says, But if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Well, yes, but how do we know which way it is? He didn't say if it was by grace or if it was by works. Oh... Look in verse 5. Verse 5 says, Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace or works. Grace. God has chosen before the foundations of the world to save a man by grace. As he says, at the present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. But he says this at the beginning. <coughs> Even so then, at this present time, also. It means that the way it was before, and that's the way it is now. No difference. The same message. Man has always been saved by grace. That's how God has saved a man. You will not find one verse of Scripture that says God ever saved a man by his works. And you will never find a story in the Bible that says that God ever lost a man once he saved him. If a man could lose his salvation, wouldn't or shouldn't there be at least one story one verse somewhere in the Bible that said that, but you can't find it. And if a man could lose his salvation and get saved again, well, shouldn't there be at least one place in the Scripture, one story, one illustration that said, yeah, here was a man that was saved, and then he got lost, and had to get saved again? Why don't you find that in the Bible? Because it can't happen. Because once you're saved, you're always saved. God cannot unsave you no more than he can unjustify you. The only way he can ever unjustify me is to take Christ and take his death having no meaning whatsoever and no power whatsoever and that he did not really die for me. He has to annul the death of Christ. And do you think he's going to do that? Christ died for me. The just for the unjust so that I can be justified, just as if I had never done anything wrong. 
as though I had never sinned in my whole life. Why well, like that? And if you have any thinking power at all, you have to say, you know, that's good. That's, that's good. That's good to know. But notice those last few words there in verse 5 when he says, Also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace. See, a lot of times we quote six verse, but we forget the verse right before. And if it's by grace, it cannot be by works. Our grace is not grace. But if it is by works, it cannot be by grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Because one annuls the other. Man's either saved by grace or not at all. There are no other options. There's no option A, B, C, D. There's only one, and that's what Christ has done for us. So, back there to Romans in chapter 10. When he makes a statement there in verse 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. How do you get his righteousness? By believing. No difference. Same thing we've always said. And then he says, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Faith cometh by hearing. So, who's to tell the message? <laughs> Those that heard it. When you hear it, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Mentioned up there in verse 17. <coughs> and so he says, in verse 11, for the scripture saith, that's Old Testament, whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. Do you know that's also mentioned several places, but it also mentions right here again in verse 13. When it says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not being ashamed is the same as being saved. You will not be confused, ashamed that you ever trusted Christ as your Savior. <coughs> because it means you won't come up short. It's not going to, it's going to be like, you know what, Christ didn't really save you. He didn't have enough power. He came up short. That's what he's talking about in the book of Galatians. Is Christ a sinner? Because I trusted him. And he didn't do it. Therefore I got to seek to be saved by my works. As though he didn't accomplish what he set out to do. No. He is the Savior. He is the author of eternal salvation. That means it's a perfect salvation. Nothing can be eternal if it's not perfect. Perfect salvation. And that's what he offers to us. But now notice, because this is why we want to have a Bible college. This is why it's so important. Verse 12 says, there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. <coughs> and we believe that. We believe that God will save Anybody who trusts him. I believe that. I believe if I can get anybody to trust the Lord. I was over here at the um, main sales the other day with my brother. I wanted to see a place a little bit more. And so we went over there and got us a little bowl of soup. And uh, this one little waitress come out. And she seen me in there enough times. And so she knew who I was. And so she was, she was friendly and... <clears throat> My brother likes to cut up a little bit. Okay, a big bit. And uh, so we're talking and friendly and having a good time. And so there was no hardly nobody else in there. I said, I want you to come to church and visit sometime. But no, just in case you don't get a chance to come. I says, I want to ask you two questions. Can, you, do you mind? Oh, no, no, that's fine. I said, Is it, isn't it true that you've heard almost all your life that Christ died on the cross and paid for all your sins? She said, yeah. I says, have you ever wondered that if he paid for all my sins and all of your sins, and everybody's sins, why does anybody go to hell? She said, never thought about that. I said, think about it for a minute. Why should you or me go to hell and pay for our sins if he paid for it? If he paid for it, you don't pay for it twice. But So why is the man going to hell? She said, I don't know. I says, because they don't believe that he did it for, th for them. And her eyes got big. I said, do you understand what I'm saying? She said, yes, I do. I said, do you see what I'm saying? She said, I, I see what you're saying. I said, if you see what I'm saying, will you trust Jesus Christ right now to take you to heaven when you die? Because you believe he paid for all of your sins. She said, yes, I will. She just a smiling, just a beaming. And I says, 
I said, if I see you 10 years from now and I asked you, where are you going when you die? I said, what would you tell me? She says, I'm going to heaven. I says, how do you know? Christ died for me. See, everybody hears that. So many preachers preach that. Churches have heard it all their life. But they don't get it. That's why you can be justified. Because Christ died for my sins. I don't have to pay for them. When you have to make Christ the Lord and the master of your life, what are you trying to do? Pay for your sins. To become worthy enough to make it. As though he didn't have to die at all. And that's why when those that don't understand it, you don't. The Bible talks about contending for the faith. What I'm doing, what Hank Lindstrom did, is contending for the faith. We would not permit or allow works to enter into our message. He says here in verse 14, How then shall they call on him of whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without somebody preaching it, without a preacher. And how shall they preach except they be sent? I often wonder, what about those that have never heard? Well, this is why we're supposed to do it. Somebody asked me that some time back. And I says, the question you just asked me about, what about those that have never heard? I says, I was 18 years old when I trusted the Lord. And I asked that same question. And I said, it bothered me for 52 years. Because of that, that's why I went to Bible school. That's why I started youth ranches. That's why I started a church and a school and had radio and TV. That's why you do everything that you did, because you do care. Because you know that if you don't do it, there'll be people that will never hear the gospel. Some people say, well, they'll be saved anyway. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. So he says up here in verse 16, For they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? When Isaiah said that in Isaiah 53, when he's talking about the Lord, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? That statement is a reference to who hath believed the gospel. Because the story he's telling there in Isaiah 53 is the gospel. He says, who is going to believe the gospel? They did not obey the gospel. They didn't believe the gospel. And that's why you and I have been so privileged to be given a wonderful message. And this is why we are supposed to explain it. If you will, take your paper and turn over <coughs> most of what's on the back side I've already explained. I've already gone through it. And I hope that it'll make it simple and clear to you. The Bible tells us, and I just want to cover that last portion of this. If you look at the second to the last paragraph, where it says, When the Apostle Paul saw the sin and the corruption in the lives of the Corinthian believers, did he change the gospel message? When Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, he was writing to a very carnal assembly of believers that desperately needed to be straightened out. So what did Paul do? Did he change the gospel message in hopes that it would result in better behavior? You know, because you want those Christians to live right, so let's just make salvation hard on them. Let's tell them they've got to change their life and to commit their life and, you know, really mean business. No, Paul didn't do that. He just simply taught correct doctrine to deal with the, the thing. So Paul taught correct doctrine to meet their need. If they did not live for Christ, they would forfeit rewards in heaven. Not if they did not live for Christ, they would not be saved. Or it was a sign they were not truly saved. You never hear Paul saying that. The last statement, some think that if Christ is not Lord of a Christian's life, then he's not really a Christian. He never really trusted the Lord. They preach, when you trust Christ, there will be an automatic change in your life. 
You'll want to pray. You'll want to read God's Word. I wish to God they did. Then I wouldn't have to try to get people to do it. It ought to be automatic. If a person gets saved and it's automatic, then why a church is so full of rebellious individuals and the Scriptures have to keep trying to straighten them out because it wasn't automatic. <coughs> Look at the next statement. Yes, you still have your old sinful nature, and yes, you will still desire to do wrong things. A believer may be carnal. That means to live according to his old nature. And it says that in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 and 3, where he says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. For ye are yet carnal. That means to be fleshly minded. It means there were those who trusted the Lord and were not living for the Lord. They were living like lost people. But in the eyes of some people, said, ah, they weren't really saved. Then where does a carnal Christian come in? He said, I could not speak unto you as spiritually mature individuals, but under babes in Christ. And so he says, For you're yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife, divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? Paul spoke to them as brethren, his brothers and sisters in the Lord. However, they were carnal brethren. Every Christian has a new nature with the right desires, but just because you have a new nature is not a guarantee that you will have an automatic change for the better in any area of your life. It is the will of God that, yes, I, as a child of God, live for the Lord. But if I don't, it doesn't do away with my spiritual birth. You can still be a child of God and never have any change in your life, and you're still his child. God didn't save you based upon a contingency plan that you've got to do this. It's contingent. I'll save you. Contingent upon how you perform. No, that's not the way it was. It was a gift. It was totally free. Look up here. This hand represents you and me, and the wall represents sin. We all have sin on us. God loves us, hates our sin. And the Bible says, since we've all sinned, we're all condemned. To go to heaven, you've got to be justified, just as if you never sinned. But uh, that's not the case. God says, by your good deeds, you'll never be justified. By trying to keep the law, doing all the good works that you can do, it will never pay for your sins. You'll never be justified by your works. So this hand represents Jesus Christ. He's the Lord God and the flesh. He came into the world because he loves us, hates our sin because our sin separates us from him. So Jesus Christ, who had no sin, did not have to die. He was God in the flesh. He came into the world. And the Bible says that he took all the sin of all the world and paid for it, came back from the dead, and said that if you and I, if we would believe that he is the Lord, Christ made the statement, unless you believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. You don't trust any man to get you to heaven, or anybody named Jesus just to get you to heaven, and just name it and claim it. You have to believe Jesus Christ is deity. Jesus Christ is the Lord. He is God in the flesh. If you confess that you believe Jesus Christ, he's God. And he paid for my sins. If I trust him, he will save me and give me as a free gift everlasting life, and I get to go to heaven on what Christ did for me. He says he loves you that much, and once you trust him, you have eternal life. Let's pray, shall we? With every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around, you may have heard it a thousand times and yet never have trusted the Lord. Or if you're watching by internet, there's nothing that you have to do. You don't have to walk an aisle. You don't have to sign a card. Don't even have to raise your hand. All you have to do is believe it. Will you do that? Are you in the auditorium? Will you believe that when Christ died, he died for you? Will you trust him, him alone, as your only hope of going to heaven? God said that if you would trust him, he would save you, give you eternal life. I pray that you will. Our Father, we thank you so much for your goodness to us for loving us so much that you sent your Son to die for us so that we could have eternal life. And the very moment we believe it, we are justified from all things 
from which we could not be justified by the law of Moses. And having been justified, we no longer have to seek to be justified. We don't have to seek to be saved, to become your child. We are your children this very moment. Thank you for all you've done for us. Bless those that are watching by internet. Help us to be a